Hey, my name is Chelsea Fagan, and I'm the founder and CEO of The Financial Diet, a totally independently owned and operated company of women who love to talk about money. Welcome to The Financial Confessions, a weekly show where we talk to people about their personal finances, their professional industry, and how money shapes their lives. You can listen to or watch new episodes of The Financial Confessions every week on YouTube or your preferred streaming platform. You can also support TFD and get exclusive access to our entire catalog of ad-free bonus videos, workshops, Discord community, our book club, and more by joining our members-only community on Patreon or YouTube. Our 2024 goal is to be primarily supported by our incredible community, and joining our membership program is the best way to do that. Enjoy the episode! Welcome, guys, to today's conversation. It's one that's been requested from you for quite some time because when it comes to the nuances of money and intimacy, we have talked about a lot of different aspects of the way those two things overlap because let's be clear, it's not a myth. Finance and money are two of the leading drivers of arguments, discord, and even divorce in relationships. Money gets between couples like few other things can, and regardless of whether you are in the early stages of dating or have been married for decades, money is going to play a huge role in the way your relationship plays itself out. But as much as we've talked about things like learning to communicate around the issue of money budget as a couple, divorce in a more healthy way, and we even have an upcoming episode on co-parenting, one thing we haven't really touched on is the way that money and the kind of troubles that money can present can affect our physical intimacy. Ultimately, as many of us probably know physical intimacy is just kind of a baseline problem in a lot of couples to begin with, and frankly, a lot of individuals to begin with. And you add heteronormative ideas around money and power and status and divisions of labor and the roles that they should be playing in the couple, and you have a recipe for disaster on many fronts. So you guys have been asking for us to speak to people who can talk specifically about that intersection of not just money, but the roles we play at home and then the roles that we play in our intimate lives. So we brought on, I think, probably two of the best qualified people to talk about it. She is an actual licensed therapist. He is just some guy, but he's also her husband. It's Xander and Vanessa, host of the massively popular Pillow Talk podcast and New York Times bestselling authors. Welcome. Thanks so much for having us. I think we're going to need to change Xander's title to that. Just some dude. (laughs) We always call him. He's my regular dude husband, but I like just some dude even better. You're here for the vibes, (laughs) here for the sex, you know, whatever. (laughs) No, don't say here for the sex. That sounds horrible. (laughs) <laughs> so just to clarify, as I mentioned, so you are actually, Vanessa, a therapist. And do you currently see clients on top of all of your media work? I don't. I started off seeing clients and my specialty has always been in sex therapy. My practice filled up very quickly and I realized, you know, there's a limit to how many people I can help. I'm saying the same things over and over again. And also, this is very intimidating for people to come in in person and talk to a stranger about the most intimate details of their sex life. So I started building out online guides and courses very early in my career and realized that was so much more popular and successful. So I eventually made that full transition over to being fully online. And that was when Xander joined the business because I just started thinking, you know, as a therapist, my training is to be very buttoned up and not share anything about myself. But I think that there's actually a lot of stuff that we can share as a couple who's been together for 16 years, who's had ups and downs in our relationship, who know what it's like to have had the spark go out. So that was how he ended up joining the biz. So, you know, obviously so much of what you do is focused on, put simply, getting people to have better sex with their partners, with randoms, with themselves, with whoever they might be doing it with. Um, But I think a lot of what you talk about also just kind of bleeds into more general concepts of intimacy, communication, romance, kind of demonstrating affection and, you know, hearing and seeing one another. Um, And as I mentioned in the intro, often kind of no matter what stage you are in a relationship, money has such an enormous impact on those things. And specifically something that we've talked about before on the show um, is the way that roles often end up shaking out in hetero partnerships, especially as it pertains to things like domestic labor, um, raising children, taking care of the house. And 
what we hear over and over again is are really kind of high levels of dissatisfaction being reported from women who are overburdened, who are often, you know, kind of taking on a really disproportionate level of work in the home and are kind of submitting to this very retrograde role, even when in many cases they also work full time. Um, but it's sort of like the macro picture of it, even if you remove the finances, as you're sort of seeing this sort of over-reliance on a very outdated model of what hetero partnership looks like, um, superimposed onto a world that is no longer at all adapted to that. My first question is kind of how do you see those same dynamics playing out in people's sex and intimacy specifically? There are so many fascinating similarities between the way that we deal with sex and the way that we deal with finances. I mean, I think one of the most basic things is this idea that we're really not supposed to talk about either one of them, right? We're supposed to just be naturally know what we're doing and be able to just have an amazing relationship with either one of them. So we see people, you know, really struggling because of the lack of education and resources and even just experience that we've had, like really dealing with these types types of things. So a lot of what you're describing the you know the mental labor aspect of it that's another one of those unifying themes between these two things that the mental labor can feel very frustrating in dealing with finances. It feels like something that really goes unspoken uh, and it can really affect also how things show up in the bedroom too. You know if you're not feeling like a true partnership then it's really going to affect your desire to be intimate with each other. Well, what is that word to, to go off of that? What does partnership really look like to the both of you when you're thinking about like a really well embodied and healthy relationship? To us, you know, partnership, it feels like we're a team mm -hmm. and we're working together on whatever challenges are coming our way or coming up in our relationship. And I think, you know, one of the biggest issues that comes up with both finances and, and with sex is that there are so many things that end up getting left unsaid and secret battles that we're each waging on our own individually without really bringing them to each other. So one example that came up for us was around finances early in our relationship, Without either of us talking about this openly or making an agreement that we were going to be doing this, Xander started taking on the primary role in our finances and very quickly started feeling a little bit resentful and a little bit lonely and a lot of pressure being put on his shoulders. So once we finally had a conversation about that and I was able to realize, like, oh my gosh, I have been backing away from responsibilities in a way that I wasn't even aware of and didn't actively want to be doing, then we were able to to come back together as a partnership and say, okay, if we're really equals in this relationship, how do we divide this up? How do we approach this in a way that's going to feel like we're both contributing? Yeah, I think that, you know, a true partnership, like you were asking about, it's not about equal division of labor per se, or like, okay, you do half and I do half. It's just both partners are involved in whatever aspect of the relationship that you're talking about is so whether that's your sex life whether that's your financial life you know you're both involved you both know what's going on you're you're both invested in some way cuz i think that it's so easy for us to fall into these whether they're gender roles or they're roles based on who earns more or whatever it's so easy to fall into these roles where it's like okay well all right i kind of i do the money in a silo or when it comes to sex it could be like okay well you know, this partner has the higher sex drive. So they're the ones who always initiate sex. I think there's so many similarities there, but yeah, it's like, you know, the, the true partnership is when we are both involved in whatever it is, regardless of how much, you know, what our differences are in that area, whether it's sex drive or earning or whatever. Well, part of the reason Xander that I wanted to have you on as well, um, is because, well, first of all, I think it's really interesting to have both of your perspectives since you collaborate so much on your work. Um, but also, I mean, candidly, uh, like all our staff is women, our audience is almost all women, most of our guests are women. We don't that often have a man's perspective on a lot of these sort of more macro dynamics as it pertains to people's roles within relationships. And I think, you know, I'll tune into the manosphere sometimes. I, I like to see what you guys are talking about. Not that you're on any of that stuff, I'm sure. but. 
a lot of the refrain seems to be around men sort of losing a lot of their identity. Um, identity often being historically centered around, you know, being the breadwinner, being, um, you know, more dominant in sort of the, the household hierarchy and, you know, having these very specific roles to play um, that now without necessarily having those things, men are, you know, they're lost, they're isolated, you know, in the worst cases, they're becoming incels or whatever, you know, that there's a, a clear lack or a need for further definition of a healthy version of masculinity that no longer exists within those previous paradigms. And I'm just really interested, speaking both as a man and someone who also speaks to men, how you personally navigate that and how you recommend young men navigate that. Yeah, that's a big question. I mean, <laughs> This it is so challenging for me personally. Uh, I was raised in a pretty progressive household. I so intellectually, I didn't want to, you know, fall into the typical kind of gender role or gender stereotype. You know, I wanted, you know, I wanted a true partner kind of in the way that I described it a couple of minutes ago. And the interesting thing is, despite all that stuff that I believed and all that stuff that I wanted intellectually, as Vanessa and I first started to get into our relationship and moved in together and started sharing finances, like I found myself just inadvertently falling into those more, you know, typical gender dynamic roles. And it took us a while to really realize that and to kind of unwind and unpack mm -hmm. that. And I think, you know, this is, again, there's such a similarity to sex here, but it's like we see this stereotype portrayed in the media, on TV, in the movies, in books so often where it's just like, oh, yeah, well, you know, OK, yeah, the the man takes care of you financially. You know, the, the guy is supposed to be in charge of the finances. You know, you're meant to be the provider. And so even though I didn't want that in my head, I, you know, I kind of had been conditioned to to react positively to <laughs> taking steps in that direction. But at the same time, I was noticing, yeah, like this doesn't feel right. Like I'm, I'm starting to feel resentful. Um, you know, I'm, I'm feeling alone. And so, you know, I think the first step was just acknowledging what was going on, like acknowledging that turmoil. I think that so often as men, you know, there's more societal conditioning of like, oh, we're supposed to be strong and silent. We're supposed to be so self-reliant. We're supposed to figure everything out on our own. And so I think that for so many men, when you start feeling that kind of internal turmoil of like, oh, I, well, I'm doing the thing that I think I'm supposed to be doing, that everyone tells me I'm supposed to be doing, I might even be getting a ton of validation externally for you know being a man. And yet I'm still feeling this angst, like, something doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel fair. You know, I, I don't feel like I'm in a true partnership. And so you try to just push it down, right? You're like, okay, I'm going to solve this problem. I'm going to solve this problem myself by being even more of a man. <laughs> by totally ignoring yeah, by, it. <laughs> by totally ignoring it. And, um, you know, and, and that ultimately can have some pretty, some pretty, you know, severe consequences. Like, you know, that can lead to, you know, mental health struggles that can lead to, you know, feeling bad about yourself, maybe acting out in other ways, or, you know, you know, you, when you push emotions down, they tend to come out somewhere else. So in a different emotion or in another behavior. And so, you know, I think that my advice to, to, you know, all men, whether you are, you know, a young man or someone that's been in this dynamic or, you know, in a relationship for a long time, and you can identify with sort of that internal struggle. The first step is just the acknowledgement. It's, you know, we got to talk about it. We can't just push it down. We can't keep it to ourselves. By talking about it, you don't have to solve the problem all in one go. It's just like, hey, I'm noticing that I am struggling with this. I'm feeling some, you know, I've got some competing ideas and I'm not sure like what, what to do. Like, let's just start to talk about it. Yeah. I think we're living in a really interesting time for men where we're wanting more from men and yet we don't have the setup for it. And, you know, like Xander was sharing his story, like we were raised by four feminists, you know, very progressive, like taught you don't need to be this way just because you're a woman or you don't have these limitations on you just because you're a man. And we both fully believed those values, looked for a partner who had those same values. And yet, even with all of that, 
we found ourselves in this relationship kind of realizing, whoa, we, we have slipped into these very stereotypical traditional roles that neither of us wanted and neither of us intended. So I think being able to recognize how strong that pull is, is very important for people of all genders. But yeah, I, I do think with men in particular, we are wanting men to be more evolved, more vulnerable, not the stereotypical alpha male that's been seen as, you know, the ideal of masculinity for so long. But we're still at the beginning of that process. And we're all kind of learning, like, well, what does that actually look like and feel like? And how do we actually, you know, deal with it as partners of men? How do we create more support, more of a system in place for this? So it's, it is a tricky time. Surely is. Well, and on the flip side, as it pertains to women and, you know, cards on the table, like we are focusing mostly on hetero partnerships because, I mean, that's personally what I'm in, but also just statistically, the majority of people do find themselves in hetero partnerships. And also that's where we see a lot of the biggest issues as it pertains to financial and um, labor imbalances in the in the marriage. You know, there's been a lot of studies that have shown that in same sex couples, a lot of these same dynamics if they do exist, it's certainly not to the same extent, in part because they're not coming in with these very specific narratives and also all of the sort of external factors that lead to, you know, one being compensated while the other is punished. Like, for example, when a couple has children, the man will earn more statistically while the woman will earn less. But kind of to that point for women, so I personally, we don't have children, we don't plan to. Um, so it's not something that I've experienced personally, but I've heard over and over from both, you know, in the media, on social media, from women in my own life even, that there's often a dynamic that takes place for women when they do have children in a couple where on top of having often a very outsized burden in terms of labor in the home and it quickly not becoming that balanced partnership that you're describing, there's also a real erosion of her identity into, you know, she's seen now as a mother and kind of less so, if at all, the other thing she was, one of whom being a sexual being. Um, And there's sort of the joke of it that's like, oh, she's not that carefree girl I married. And like, meanwhile, she's like saddled with like a screaming child, a full-time job and the entire house to take care of. And it's like, well, of course she's not. Um, But women, I think, are, are often really punished for just sort of dealing with the very normal reaction of being in this very unsustainable position. And often for women, I think their sexuality can be the one of the first things to go. Um, so for couples who are, and, and women um, who are kind of in that dynamic, what do you recommend to them? Well, one of the reasons we were excited to talk to you is because we are also child-free by choice. And it's very hey. rare to, to find other couples out there. So glad to have that similarity with you. I think I saw a very cute dog behind you, so... Oh, there are, yeah, there are two very cute dogs behind us, actually. Well, yeah, they they both jumped up to the chair. They were actually trying to get onto our laps earlier, and we're like, no. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah those are the children. They're living that meme, the, uh, like, no one has a better life than dogs, like, with parents who don't want to have kids. Um, they're definitely living that life. But, yeah, to, to get back to your question, you know, we do a lot of work with parents. I'm, you know, marriage and family therapists, so so much of my training and, and work has been with families. Families. Um, but what you're saying is absolutely correct that, you know, that transition into becoming a mom is really difficult for so many reasons. And sex and intimacy is one of those big ones. It's something that couples are just not prepared for. All that you really get after having a child is that six week checkup where, you know, for some couples, it's going to be at six weeks for others. It's at a different time. But basically, a doctor will tell you, OK, you probably won't get seriously injured or experience excruciating pain if you start trying to have intercourse again. And that's it. <laughs> it's just a sort of expectation that, oh, yeah, we passed that mark and everything's good to go Yeah, back to normal, back to normal. All right. Just as women have this pressure for our bodies to physically snap back after childbirth as if nothing had ever happened. Like it's, there's also that pressure that our sex life should just snap back. And that's absolutely not the case. So the place that I always start is just normalizing, like your sex life is not going to be the same that it was before having kids. Cause most parents are just so wildly unprepared for that, that even that fact feels wild to them. So starting there, 
And then, then we can get into like a lot of practical tips for how do we start to, you know, reconnect and reconceptualize what does intimacy look like at this period of our relationship? So one of the big pieces of advice that we like to give is to deprioritize intercourse. So for a woman who's just given birth, intercourse feels like a lot. You've had a serious trauma to your body. You might still be experiencing pain or discomfort. It just feels like a very high bar. And this is one of the huge problems that comes up with heterosexual couples is that we see intercourse as the be all end all. Like we even use the word sex and intercourse interchangeably, right? As if intercourse is, it's the main event. It's mm -hmm. the, the home run when you're running the bases type of thing. But intercourse is just one of of so many ways to be physically intimate with each other. And so if you recognize other things as sex, like count everything as sex, that's one of our mottos, like everything counts as sex, that can be a great way to start easing back into physical intimacy. So there may be days where all you're really feeling up to is being naked together and, you know, holding each other in bed, or maybe it's just a little makeout session like you used to have when you were teenagers. Maybe it's just a hug. Maybe it's using your hands on each other or oral sex. You know, there are so many different options to pick from, and that can feel a lot easier of a way to start you know, being intimate with each other again. Yeah, I think the mistake that a lot of couples make, though, is that, you know, if, if you know, if she feels like, okay, I'm not up for intercourse, and therefore, you know, I need to shy away from all physical intimacy, because I don't want it to lead to intercourse, because I don't feel up to it. And that's where so many couples get is this idea that, oh, well, we can't have physical intimacy, unless I'm willing to have intercourse. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you avoid that. And then all of a sudden it's like, okay, well, where, where is the, you know, where is that emotional connection between us? Um, and, you know, it's, it's so easy to just get into this hole where then it's been like months and months and months without, you know, one of the most important things in your relationship. And so, you know, just like, just like it would be totally normal for any couple to think, okay, after we have kids, like, our financial situation is going to be different. We're going to be spending more, right? Mm -hmm. Like after we have kids, our sleep schedule is going to be different. We we're, you know, there's no way that we're going to be on the same schedule. I think it's, a, you have to have the same kind of acknowledgement around your sex life. Our sex life isn't going to look exactly the same way. So we have to talk about how we can adjust in ways that we can still prioritize intimacy. When it comes to almost anything in life, a compromise is inevitable. And I'm always up for compromising, but when it comes to my health, both physical and mental, compromising is simply not an option. I spoke at length earlier this year in a YouTube video, but truly nothing is worth compromising on when it comes to your well being. And a good doctor, therapist, support system, I need all of them. And to that end, I am happy to be continuing our partnership with our friends at ZocDoc for another episode of TFC. As I already mentioned, over the past month or two, I have been doing all of my doctoring that I've been putting off for quite some time, basically any kind of appointment, you name it, I've been doing it. And I use ZocDoc for literally 100% of my medical appointments. And without it, honestly, I don't think I would do it because the act of finding a doctor that is in my location that has availability at my time and takes my insurance would be so overwhelming that that alone would prevent me from seeing the doctor. But ZocDoc makes it easy and effortless, and they help me keep track of all my appointments and even text me reminders so that I never miss anything. And if for whatever reason you're not feeling your best, finding the right care shouldn't take up your time and energy. That's where ZocDoc comes in to help. Using their free app that millions of users rely on, you can find the right doctor that meets your needs and fits your busy schedule. Here in New York City, some doctors are booked up for weeks, if not months in advance, and that's not particularly helpful when you have something that needs timely attention. With ZocDoc, you can book an appointment with a few taps in their app, choose from thousands of patient-reviewed doctors and specialists, browse doctor profiles, upload and verify your insurance insurance information and get the care you need in one place. Go to ZocDoc.com slash TFC and download the ZocDoc app for free. Then find and book a top rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc.com slash TFC. ZocDoc.com slash TFC. So as many of you might know, I have been on a bit of a food spending and food habit journey this year. I spent the whole month of February cooking 100% of my meals at home from scratch. And while I'm definitely now doing a little bit of restaurants and delivery, it is nowhere near the scale I used to be doing it at. 
And given how much I've been changing my food habits, especially as it pertains to food shopping, it is perfect that right now we are partnering with Hungry Root. Hungry Root makes it super easy to eat healthy. They send you fresh, high quality groceries and simple recipes to take the guesswork out of your meal planning and prepping. Take a short quiz and Hungry Root will get to know your personal health goals, what you like to eat and more. Then they'll build you a personalized cart with all your grocery needs for the week and give you delicious recipe recommendations to put those groceries to use. Each order is fully customizable so you can take their suggestions or like me, choose other things that you might want. I did a combination of both. They've got fresh produce, high quality meat and seafood, healthy snacks, smoothies, sweets, ready to eat meals, kids snacks, vitamins, supplements, and more. Like I said, I personally did some of their suggested groceries based on meals that they curated, but I also swapped out some of the things for other ingredients that I've been wanting to try. Notably, I got this tandoori masala paneer that I turned into a really nice Indian chopped salad the other night, which you can see here. And tonight I'm gonna be making drunken noodles with the rice noodles that I got from Hungry Root. That's true. Everything from Hungry Root follows a simple standard. It's gotta taste good, be quick to make, and contain whole trusted ingredients. Right now, Hungry Root is offering the Financial Confessions listeners 40% off your first delivery and free veggies for life. Go to HungryRoot.com slash TFC to get 40% off your first delivery and get your free veggies. That's HungryRoot.com slash TFC. Don't forget to use our link so they know that we sent you. Well, on the child-free stuff, um, because we don't always, we don't that often have guests who have made that choice for themselves. Can you talk about what led the two of you to decide not to have children? We started our relationship with both of us thinking that we were going to have kids. We both just Mm -hmm. always saw that in our futures. We had a lot of conversations before we got serious and before we got married, making sure we were on the same page. And we ended up meeting each other and getting married earlier than I think either of us anticipated finding a life partner. And so for us, it was always this this conversation of, yeah, let's get married. Let's enjoy life as a young married couple and we'll have kids later. And so we kept checking in with each other as the years went by. Like, is the time feeling right for you now? Is it feeling right for you now? And eventually we got to a point where we realized, you know, this is the time that we quote unquote should be starting to create our family, but neither one of us are really feeling the active desire for it. And so that became the central guiding question for us. Do we actively want children? We'd had this idea in our heads that we did previously. We had a ton of societal pressure telling us that we were supposed to, and that's the next logical step. But we kept coming back to that question of, is this something that we actively want? And I can say for myself in particular, I really kept thinking about a potential future child And this feeling came up for me so strongly where I thought, you know, I would want to be able to look my child in the eye and say, I wanted you so badly. I was so excited to bring you into this world. For me, I knew I knew I would be a great mom. I knew that whatever kid I might have, I would, of course, love and it would, of course, have, you know, amazing experiences. But when I kept coming back to that question of, you know, is this something that I actively want, the answer just continued to be no for me. And so the the idea of, of bringing a life into the world that I didn't actively want just didn't feel right for me. And that, you know, that may help other people that may not feel appropriate for other people. Obviously, everybody's journey is different. But for us, yeah, we realized, you know, it's just not something that we're feeling like we really want to do. And I think the really interesting thing was, you know, that for us, that decision that, you know, it it wasn't an immediate decision, like, no, we're not going to have kids. It was like, the first decision was, okay, well, now it's feeling more like we might not. And so we're going to continue, we're going to make life choices that are more in line with not having kids. Like, we're not going to be like, you know, taking the promotion or the new job or, you know, saving in the way that we might under the assumption that we are going to have kids. We'll just, you know, we'll, we'll live our life as if we are not. And that was the first, I think that was the first time for both of us where we really kind of questioned a, a real societal norm or did something that was really different from what we expected. And, you know, getting back to that question of, you know, of like gender roles and, and whatnot, like, I think it's it can be really hard to 
to, you know, to break out of that first box of like, okay, well, I'm a man, I'm supposed to take care of my wife financially, or like, we're married, we're supposed to have kids. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's figuring out, you know, what is that first real big kind of societal norm that you're actually going to question and make a different decision. And then it becomes so much easier after that to be like, oh, oh, you know what? I did something that people weren't expecting and nobody died. <laughs> In fact, I'm I'm thriving. Everything is great. Like I could I could keep making decisions that aren't necessarily in in the box that that people expect. And so you know, whether it, that's around your sex life, whether that's around how you do your finances or or what type of work you do, or whether you have kids, I think it's just, you know, trying to get the courage to, you know, question that first kind of societal assumption and everything gets a lot easier from there. Well, I think you're not really your analogy, but your sort of thought experiment, Vanessa, of envisioning this person existing and really asking yourself, is this something that I very actively want, is not an exercise that I think enough people take on, not just about having children, but about so many things that we're taught to want. I mean, from a financial perspective, homeownership is a huge one that most people, I mean, the amount of people who sleepwalk into homeownership and end up in a very tough financial situation um, or who end up in the home that isn't right for them or is too expensive for them because not only are they being pressured to do it, but that we sort of view it as a threshold of adulthood um, or a box to check. I mean, and the worst case scenario there is like you could, I mean, end up you know, upside down on a mortgage or foreclosed on. I mean, a lot of bad things can happen, but in the case of having a child, I mean, something I often come back to is, you know, it sounds like you guys had great parents. I was lucky to have really good parents. Um, but a lot of people don't. There are a lot of bad parents out there. There are a lot of harmful, abusive, neglectful, you know, uh, parents who, you know, in some cases, in probably many cases, if it had been something that they were more actively able to choose, might not have had those children because most people, I think, on some level are smart enough to know um, when they're sort of ready for something and it's really important to them. And don't get me wrong, I'm sure there would still be cases of people who, you know, desperately want a child and, you know, just it turns out they couldn't make it work. But I think in a lot of cases, especially in previous generations, this was just people defaulted to it and had to, in the worst case, work themselves back out of it, as opposed to, in my view, with something this consequential, it should be something where you start from neutral and you work your way into it, you know? Um, and it really surprises me that not enough couples, in my opinion, or when you look at the stats, are really kind of thinking that through when it comes to all kinds of life decisions, that there's not a very active conversation that takes place. So for your guys' sort of toolkit that you would recommend for couples, not just about sex and intimacy or children or any one particular question, is there a way that you recommend people approach conversations about big things that can be intimidating or embarrassing or potentially awkward? Yeah, we so we wrote sex talks because we knew that people really struggle to have tough conversations about, you know, obviously about sex. And we all have heard the advice to, you know, oh, just talk about it with your partner, talk yeah. about it more openly. But yeah, this is gonna be a tough conversation. Just have it. Yeah, we don't know how to have those conversations. Like, what do I say? How do I say it? When do I say it? So we wrote the book really with that in mind. And we wanted to guide people through a specific journey of these five conversations that we really think will help any couple's love life. Um, so that, that book is all about, you know, that communication, but I think, you know, to pull out a couple of pieces from the book, one thing, and this is another great similarity between money and sex, but one thing is the importance of thinking about our wants the word that you use sleepwalk is such a great example. Like we all sleepwalk into things so easily, like, you know, home ownership or all these shoulds that we've been taught to have. And that comes up with sex as well. I'm, I am supposed to be this way. I should do this. I should not do that. And I think the best antidote to that is for us to flip that question around and ask ourselves, well, what is it that I really want? Not what do I think I'm supposed to, or what's the right thing or what's the next step? but what is something that I really want? So that's a great question to ask yourself. And obviously it's a hard one. You're, you're not going to have 
all the perfect answers just spring up instantly the second that you ask yourself that question. But I think just that one step of turning it around and being more active and intentional, thinking about what is it that I want can be a really beneficial place to start. <clears throat> when it comes to, you know, intimacy between, because for me, I feel like when it comes to the financial dynamics between partners, most, if maybe the majority, if not most things can be worked out, improved upon, overcome. But there are definitely points at which there's either a an inherent or a willful level of incompatibility. Um, and just, you know, there's, you can't really go beyond that. I mean, in the case of finances, obviously financial abuse, but if two people have radically different visions and desires for their financial planning and their priorities and all of these things, there can be a situation where, you know, either it may not be a fit as a relationship or you need to have completely separate finances, which many couples do. I mean, my husband and I have almost entirely separate finances for a lot of reasons, and that works for us. With intimacy, you can't really have two entirely different intimate lives. I mean, I suppose you theoretically could, but it's definitely an area of sort of enforced compatibility to some extent. Um, you can't really do it in parallel as much. Do you have a sort of general litmus test for when a problem is worth working on and solving versus when it might be time to kind of call it? And if people feel like they're in a relationship where sex and intimacy is just not a part of that relationship, do you feel like you have any words of advice for people in potentially continuing it? Well, I definitely have to call out like the one option for having the tandem is that we can have open relationships or all different sorts of you know relationship structures that we think are totally valid. And another great example of something couples should actively think about, like, is monogamy really the model that works for me or yeah, maybe the, yeah, default. the default, the thing that we're supposed to do? So when it comes to sexual incompatibility, this is something that gives so many of us a lot of anxiety. <laughs> So for one, this is why we recommend couples start talking about sex early in their relationship. We've worked with so many couples who have gotten years, decades into the relationship and never really talked about it openly. And it can feel a lot trickier to be, you know, really established in a relationship and then finally starting to ask these questions of are we truly compatible or not? So talking about sex earlier in the relationship is definitely something that's very helpful. But when it comes to incompatibilities, as a sex therapist, I've found that it's often something that we feel more anxious about than actually plays out in real life. So most couples are going to have, I would actually say all couples are going to have incompatibilities to some extent or another. Like it would be very weird to find a partner who wanted sex at the exact same time you did every single time, the exact same kind of sex. Like it's just not really possible. Yeah. Just like you wouldn't expect your partner to like spend their, you know, if you give two partners a hundred dollars, like you're not going to expect each partner to spend their hundred dollars exactly equally. Right. Yeah. So having that open communication about your sex life is a great way to help you recognize that those incompatibilities or those differences are just normal and okay. Another piece of this is recognizing that, you know, that it is um, very normal for us to, you know, to have these differences and things that we want. And, and sometimes like when we're able to talk about them out loud, you recognize, okay, yeah, maybe I would love a partner who was into exploring this certain fantasy with me, or I would love to have a partner who might want to try this with me. When you're able to just say it out loud and your partner can say, hey, yeah, maybe that's not something that's so interesting to me or I'm not, I'm not really open to doing that, you can feel a little bit bummed out. Like, of course, you wanted to explore that with your partner. That makes sense. But for most people, it's not going to be a huge deal breaker. So that's really the point that you have to get to to decide whether or not this is truly going to be an issue. Being able to say it out loud and talk about like, yeah, is this something that you're interested in and seeing what your partner thinks from there. Another piece of it too is that there are always little pieces of it to play with too. So your partner might say, oh, well, you know, I'm not really interested in the whole, you know, fantasy that you have, but maybe I'd try this little piece of it, or I'd be curious about doing this little thing, or, you know, there are a lot of different ways to like get creative with it. 
Yeah, I think that we are, we so often tend to really not want to have these conversations about potential incompatibilities when it comes to sex, because we're so worried that we're going to find out like, oh, this, like my partner hates this. They're going to, you know, I'm going to feel ashamed and it's never going to happen. And yeah, like Vanessa said, it's hard for us to really know how we're actually going to feel about something until we hear from our partner, like, are, are they open to this? or not like you know it might even feel to you in your head like oh my god if they are not into this it's a total deal breaker for me but then the reality is when you actually talk about it you might find it not feeling like that or it might even be the other way around it's like there's no way for you to know until you actually have that conversation and again that's why it's so nice to t to try to talk about these things earlier on so that you just have those data points. You're going into a relationship eyes wide open, like knowing what you can reasonably expect and what you can't reasonably expect. But, you know, at, at the end of the day, I think it's, you know, you got to just have that conversation and then assess, okay, how do I really truly feel about this? And yeah, and if you do get to the point where there are enough things where it's like, okay, I just, you know, I do feel like I can't be, fulfilled in the way that I want to, then that, that maybe is a good sign that, you know, it could be time to move on, but there's really no way to know until you actually have that conversation. Well, on the point of, you know, non-monogamy and polyamory, it's a conversation that I always like, I like that we're having a more, you know, open-minded conversation. I mean, to your point, like the fact that we're now able to more openly choose not to have children, for example, like <clears throat> even for the people who don't do it, it's likely of some benefit to have the conversation because it puts a higher, it, it makes you think, it makes everyone think more critically about it. The more it's a, it's a question that you arrive to an answer rather than a default conclusion. I, that I completely agree with. However, I do sometimes worry when, you know, that we're not that we're having the conversation about opening relationships romantically but yet it's happening on a backdrop of a real cultural crisis especially in hetero marriages of men as they age put simply having no friends um where women are kind of the center of the man's emotional life she is his sort of checks every box for emotional fulfillment he she you know, dictates the social life. She makes the plan. She maintains the connections. She is the one that he tells his secrets to. And he probably the only person he says, I love you to in many cases. And, you know, for me, I, I often ask myself, you know, are, are we as couples even looking into how diversified we are emotionally, platonically, not even romantically? Like for me, it's like, I don't care who your husband's sleeping with, but how many like people does he say I love you to in his life and, and, you know, not need to be having sex with that person in order to feel it because we've so heavily conditioned uh, relationships to kind of function this way. And we see all of the really negative health impacts of that social isolation amongst men and, and what it does to women as a result as well. Um, and I'm, I'm interested as to where platonic intimacy and platonic love kind of factors into your view of a healthy sex and intimacy life in your marriage or relationship? It's a really, really great topic to bring up. I mean, if you look at the history of marriages, we're living in this time where we put more pressure on our romantic relationships than we ever have before. You know, where in the past it was just a, a financial arrangement or a security arrangement, the bonding of two tribes, where now it's, you know, our partner has this, we have this pressure that they're supposed to be our best friend and our lover and our, you know, confidant. teammate and our confidant and all the things, you know, our soulmate, that one person in the entire world that we were truly meant to be with. It's an incredible pressure. And you layer that on top of all these aspects of masculinity that we were starting to talk about earlier, 
uh, you know, where this this difficult socialization that men receive around needing to be competent all the time, not being able to ask for help, not showing emotions. You know, it, I think male friendship is a really interesting topic that so many men struggle with. Of like, yeah, how do you create meaningful relationships with somebody if you don't feel societal permission to express your inner world to another person? So there can be this extra layer of pressure coming from men on, you know, this, my wife, my girlfriend, this is the one person in the world that I feel comfortable sharing my inner world with. And, and then I think on top of that too, you know, most men have been conditioned that, you know, it's not okay to show emotion outside of kind of two things. And I think that would be sports and sex. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like when your team wins a big game or loses the big game, you get to be like really happy. You get to cry. That's fine. And then sex is like the other way where men are allowed to express that emotion. Sex or, you know, the direct aftermath of sex. Right. And so, you know, then that adds this other layer of pressure for the sex life where it's like if the, you know, if the sex isn't happening in just the way that he wants it, he can feel like, well, like now I don't have any outlet for my emotions at all. And this also, we're kind of taking this in a slightly different direction than where you were asking it, but this also feeds into desire as well. You know, a lot of women feel that pressure from their partner and, you know, it starts to feel like it, it decreases your desire from them. I mean, desire needs some amount of distance in order to really be able to flourish. And so when you feel your partner being reliant on you for all, all the things in their life, like it makes it hard to also tune into sexual desire. A hundred percent. Also, Xander, I regret to inform you that there's a whole sub discourse on, you know, like men not expressing themselves in certain ways, even during sex, because that's too effeminate or too, um, you know, vulnerable or whatever. So even that's off the table now. Sorry. Sorry, fellas. It's actually, it's actually gay to have hetero intercourse now. So <laughs> we're out of options. Um, no, I think that's true. I mean, I, that lack of desire, you know, that you're pointing to when you feel so overburdened to be so much for the other person. I think that really comes back to what we discussed at the beginning was we have so many hetero partnerships that are so out of whack in terms of what each person is asking of the other. And also, I mean, listen, all of this against the backdrop of late capitalism, we're all exhausted. We're all overworked and underpaid. So there's that whole sort of context to it as well. But there's, at least in my view, there's this really strong feeling that, you know, we are increasingly, to your point, asking so much of our partnerships that even in the best case scenario, no two people can really fully provide to each other. Um, so even in your own marriage, like what are ways in which you kind of relieve the pressure from each other? Well, friendships is definitely a really important one. You know, I think a lot of couples get into the habit of socializing with other couples and it, it's easy, right? Like, yeah, we'll just do the double date, the triple date, you know, but we do try to be really intentional about having separate friendships and pursuing time separately, you know, with, with friends that, that helps a lot. Also just having separate hobbies, um, being able to have time away from each other where we're doing our own things, you know, especially as a couple who is married and also works together. We spend a lot of time together. So we have to be really intentional about creating those separate interests. But I think that, you know, hobbies in, in particular can be really beneficial because we get to learn new things about each other and see each other in new lights. And, you know, like Xander's a surfer, that's his one of his main hobbies. And that's not of any interest to me. I've tried it a few times. It is not my thing. But to be able to hear, you know, see him exploring that and, you know, gaining competence in it and sharing stories with me, like, I think that's, that can be a really great way of just feeling like, yeah, he has that other outlet. And then I get to feel the excitement and joy from it. But I also get to benefit from that being his outlet. <laughs> yeah. And I think, uh, I think that, you know, the, the way I also look at it too, is like, you know, Vanessa and I show up as a team in terms of trying to take care of all the tasks around the house, whether that's work stuff or house stuff, so that we can each give each other the space to do all the things that we need. And that's kind of a way that's helped me sort of conceptualize like, you know, our division of labor 
so to speak, where it's like, yeah, you know, hey, we live in a house together. We have a household. We got to do a lot of stuff. Um, and yeah, like if I want to, if I want to get up early and like surf all morning, cause there's great waves, like, yeah, I got to do some things to support us being able to do that. And so, you know, I think that this can be a whole, a virtuous cycle. If, you know, if you are in a relationship and you guys each can figure out, Hey, what are the things that we want to do on our own outside of this? You know, how much time is that going to take? How much money is that going to take? Okay, so how are we going to each set ourselves up for success? You know, that gives you the motivation right there to start, you know, splitting up tasks and actually be motivated to get ahead on things so that you can have time for stuff. I think that, you know, a lot of guys can fall into that trap of like, all right, well, I just want to come home from work and like sit on the couch and watch TV. And like, you're not really thinking about like, oh, okay, well, how can I, how can I help out? Cause you know, I haven't been <laughs> conditioned to think that way. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think that just, yeah, the separate time and the hobbies really play an important role in, you know, in being motivated for, you know, to spend time together and have that intimacy because we've been apart, but also being motivated and excited about the household labor that is required to make that space. Very Esther Perel, by the way, to like need to see someone doing their own thing um, and getting to see them through different eyes. I like I'm a big Esther Perel fan as well. And I, I always that always sticks out to me because I do think it's something that we don't, especially again for women who I think we often take so much of their identity away, especially as they become mothers, that you don't get to see them doing and being themselves. And not that obviously, I mean, you know, being a wonderful mother and getting so much joy and satisfaction out of that, of course, is a beautiful thing as well, but that we allow people to be less and less of themselves. We don't like people to have multiple identities. We don't like, and I think there can often be in, in more unhealthy relationships, a real territorialness. I mean, I know I know that there are people, and I'm sure you've encountered them in your clinical work, who get envious if their spouse spends time with other people, even platonically, or does other hobbies. So kind of as a final thing to think about, if you are one of those people who finds yourself feeling, you know, whether it's envious or slighted or you just can't find yourself being happy for your partner the way that you would like to be. What are some things that you would suggest to allow that person to kind of work it out on their own as well as in tandem with that with their partner? What that indicates to me as a therapist is that you're feeling dissatisfied with the quality time that you're getting with your partner. If you're feeling mm -hmm. jealous of them, you know, having other friendships or exploring other interests, like it, it seems that you feel like you're not getting that part of them, like somebody else is getting to experience them in a certain way. So rather than fixating on the external things that they're doing, I would really take a look at what is that time that the two of you are spending together. I mean, a lot of couples fall into the trap of spending time in each other's presence, but not actually being fully present with each other. So no, the two of you sitting on opposite ends of the couch watching TV while you're also scrolling on your phones doesn't count as quality time. So we have to be more intentional about what is that time that we're actually spending together? Are we having meaningful conversations or are we, um, there's a really interesting statistic that uh, when people, be when couples become parents, somewhere like 40% of their conversations become purely transactional, just about scheduling and who's doing what. So, you know, are you actually having meaningful conversations with your partner? Are you spending time doing things that you love, doing new things together? So you get some of that, you know, excitement um, of, of just being together. So I would look there. And, and the second place that I would look to is, looping in all these themes that we've been talking about, like, do you feel like your partner is a true partner? Or are you feeling like, hey, I'm over here carrying 95% of the emotional load, doing 95% of the tasks and responsibilities while you're out there chugging beers with your friends or, you know, hanging out <laughs> and doing other stuff. So I would, I would look there too. And I think the last place you could also look like, you know, if, if it's not what Vanessa just said of like, you know, like, okay, you know, you're, you're just out there having fun while I'm, you know, picking up all the slack. You could also look at, okay, am I feeling jealous because my, my partner's out there hanging out with, with their friends? Like, huh, 
do you know, do I actually wish that I was hanging out with my friends more? Mm-hmm. It was, am I actually wishing that I could have some more, I, I would love some more friendships. And like, you know, once you think about it that way, it becomes pretty clear. Okay. The answer is not they aren't allowed to hang out with friends. The answer is maybe I need to put myself out there a little more and call up some of my friends or put myself in a situation where I can make some new friends. Because yeah, you know, the answer should never be like, oh, let's just restrict what somebody else wants to do so I can feel better about myself. Like, how can I feel better about myself? How can I get the same thing that I see my my partner getting? Well, this was a delightful conversation. I'm I very rarely speak to two people at once, let alone a couple, but you guys have like such a perfect little symphony going. Um, which I'm sure is obviously from your podcast, but still delightful. Um, so on that note, I know the paperback uh, edition of your book, Sex Talk, just came out. So where can people go to get it? You can go to sextalksbook.com to find links to all the major retailers. And we also have a quick little form that you can fill out on that page where we'll send you a free workbook to help you dive even deeper into the book. Wonderful. Well, thank you both. Almost said Vander and Zanessa. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much, Xander and Vanessa, for joining us. And thank you all at home for tuning in. And I will see you back here next week on an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and be sure to tune in next week for an all new episode of The Financial Confessions. The Financial Confessions is created by The Financial Diet and hosted by me, Chelsea Fagan. It is produced by Alexa Brooks Major and Holly Trantham. Recording and editing by Emily Fisher and music and sound effects are from Epidemic Sound. Want more of our content? Head over to our YouTube page, The Financial Diet, to see our monthly deep dives, videos of this show, and our entire backlog of videos and podcasts. I'll talk to you next week.